Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, happy Monday and happy Halloween, and welcome to this 11th episode of the Invisible Museum Tour. My name is Jeff Olson. I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America, and I will be your fellow traveler on today's journey. Our show is sponsored by Royal Talents North America, Blick Art Materials, and the Z Academy. We would like to thank them all for the support for this wonderful art educational programming. Uh, now let me introduce our host. Her work is featured in numerous prominent private and public collections around the world, and she is the recipient of many awards, including the Alex Award in Visual Arts. She's an art historian and educator working for over a decade at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. She's the co-founder of the nonprofit Project Awe on a mission dedicated to exploring connections between Western esotericism and the arts. She is also the founder of the Z Academy, where she mentors students of all ages. Please, everybody, join me in welcoming the incomparable Genya Gershman. <laughs> Genya, how is it going? It's going great. I just want to um, tell everybody how excited we are to be back, to see you. We've already planned the next tours for the remainder of 2012, uh, 12, 2022. I'm 10 years off. Well, take us uh, back. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to thank that this is truly possible, uh, a free program, educational program, because of Royal Talents North America and now Blick. I'm so proud that the two of them are sponsoring this. Thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to say, since it's our I can't believe 11th tour together. We started dressing the same with Jeff without even checking. <laughs> so you could see we have the same shirt. We're vibing uh, uh, late Renaissance for you. That's right. So I'm, going, I'm going full Baroque, full Baroque. <laughs> All right. I'm going to share my, my PowerPoint really quickly. So let's get that going. Here we are. And uh, uh, you are here for, of course, the, the Invisible Museum Tours. And today, I love to do something different every time. So today, you really are a witness to magic, a witness to transformation, to mysteries. You are going to be not just witnessing, you are going to be actively decoding and partaking in alchemical and Kabbalistic exercises. So I hope you're up for it. It's 10 a.m. in Los Angeles. It may be 12 or 1 p.m. or in Europe, it might be evening. I hope you're ready for this uh, journey. So we begin with the idea of uh, talking paintings. This is how we advertised uh, this segment. And I really wanted to show you that this tradition exists from early medieval uh, times in uh, Western European art. And here we have a panel from Madrid, from a beautiful museum, uh, Tisha Bermit, I can't pronounce it, Jeff. Um, yeah, your guess is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, somebody in the audience help us, Titian Bermetitia Museum. And um, we have an, an, an annunciation of sorts, and we have an angel delivering the message to actually uh, Mary's mother that uh, she will be pregnant with Mary, with the Holy Virgin. And in order to say that, uh, there is actually a scroll exiting. He's opening his mouth, and the scroll is exiting his mouth, and he's speaking. This is like a modern... Uh, 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 comic strip, right? So it's a mm -hmm. it's a talking balloon, and a traditional term for this is a banderole because it looks like a scroll that's unwrapping. And so this was a very direct way to let the viewer know that this is a talking painting. It's time to listen in. Um, most of the time, these type of talking paintings were reserved for religious imagery, so it is not surprising that the text would be in Latin. So my daughter, who took Latin helped me decipher it. Um, Ego sum angelus domini atemisus. I am the angel of the Lord sent to you. So sent to you uh, uh, to give a message from God. A beautiful detail. And then That's we interesting. Mm -hmm. be, and you, the whole topic of hidden messages, even though it's right there, we're talking about a mostly lay congregation, right? That was illiterate. So even this was kind of directed towards a select group of viewers, right? It's very interesting. You know how uh, we 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 are really going to talk about the confluence of text and image, right? And how you can even take in text as an image. And we've moved away from text towards emoji, basically images. And if you showed emoji to a medieval viewer, they probably just not understand what in the world we're trying to say, but we add like seven of them and all of a sudden you know exactly how the person is feeling. So there is this idea of text as being as a symbol, 
which is the medieval Renaissance and Baroque viewer are going to be really great at reading, right? So it's very, very interesting uh, um, metaphor and indeed an exercise. So here we have, uh, even though we're talking about a lot about Rembrandt today, um, of course, we always go back to Vincent who adored Rembrandt. I can't think of Rembrandt without Vincent. And um, he has many amazing quotes on Rembrandt. And he said, Rembrandt is so deeply mysterious. And that's what the stress of today's tour is, the mysteries uh, today, that he says things for which there are no words in any language. And I pause here for just a moment because we are indeed going to be studying words in Rembrandt's art, but in order for us to warm up, I want to show you how there are deeper mysteries that for which there are no words, and yet Rembrandt is able to tell us. And uh, this is the best example, the Jewish bride, and we're going to be seeing a lot of Jewish subject matter today um, about which we're going to talk about the confluence between Christianity and Judaism, a crossover between the religions to reach deeper depths of mystery. And this amazing painting, as we know, Van Gogh sat for, for, for hours in front of, and he said, if I could even sit, you know, uh, a week in front of it with just a glass of water, he was so moved by it. And uh, a little warm up um, is that it's called the Jewish bride. And uh, the title actually was stuck onto it um, by one of the historians early on trying to uh, attribute a title to it. And because of that, so many, you know, uh, scholars had guessed who this couple might be. They suggested this could be somebody as Abraham and Sarah or Isaac and Rebecca. Uh, one scholar actually said, no, it's Titus during his wedding. It's Titus himself. So regardless who this is, what we see and why why these parallels of, of a couple, like uh, uh, the loving couples like this, even perhaps Rembrandt's son, is because we do see the moment of tenderness and love. If I had to think about the most tender painting in the history of art, this is the one that comes to mind. But here's my first question to Jeff and our audience. Why in the world, if they're loving each other, if this perhaps even could be a wedding moment, an embrace, why aren't they looking at each other? So if hopefully our audience can participate and type a, a few of their suggestions, but of course, we'll start with Jeff. What are your thoughts, Jeff? Well, he's definitely looking at her. You can see the depth of appreciation and love that he is sharing directly through his gaze. But you're right. She's kind of looking out and forward almost like to the future or, or the, the, I don't know, a, a, a possible picture of their life together, maybe. And uh, this is a really astute comment as always. And I bring us a little bit closer and this is the hint for our viewers. You could see the placement of their hands. And I would actually probably um, uh, take his gaze. It looks like it's directed towards her, but it sort of slides over her. It's, I think like her, he's um, also perhaps suggested to be looking ahead towards her in the future, their future together. And uh, with the hands, we could see that one is placed on the heart and she's uh, reciprocating that gesture and the other hand is placed on her stomach. So do we have any comments from our audience? Um, let's see, we've got a few of them coming through. Uh, maybe there, there's a fear, fear or apprehension of the future in this. Very interesting. So uh, uh, many, many sentiments that could come uncertainty, right? It would, could be one of them. Um, well, I'm going to give, uh, if there's more comments, let me know, Jeff. Um, yeah, and we do- troubled. I think people are kind of queuing in on that. I guess if you know Rembrandt's history and his family, and, and uh, uh, especially with his ch many children, you could probably attribute that anxiety in the picture towards his real life experience, right? So I, I will, um, we're starting to talk about children. So this future of the generation is very interesting. And I will answer my own question uh, with a little biographical uh, note. Uh, when I was in Russia, 
I saw this painting in, in Moscow. I was born in Moscow uh, in the Tritikov Gallery. And uh, this is by Marc Chagall. And I was extremely, I was about maybe nine years old when my parents took me to see this. And I was so moved by this image specifically because you see this Jewish wedding and you see the angel uh, like we saw in Annunciation imagery, right? Pronouncing the future, pronouncing the pregnancy. And here on the uh, uh, bride's cheek, a drawing, a tattoo of her future, her unborn child. And uh, it's really interesting because we could see that it's almost certain that Chagall would have looked at the Jewish bride and uh, the composition is almost identical. So he is uh, responding, he's almost giving us an answer of what is this that they're doing? Uh, the, the husband placing the hand on the heart, the heart below the heart, right? So there's the beating of the second heart, the unwritten, something you can't put into the words, the future of this child, the future of this family, and then she's placing also the hand on her stomach. So uh, a beautiful, uh, going back to Van Gogh's quote, for uh, Rembrandt is able to show us something invisible, something mysterious, for which there's no words almost. It's hard to put it into words. And I wanted to transition to the fact that indeed, Rembrandt and his circle, uh, particularly his students were extremely interested in the mystery, in the uh, uh, perfectly for us, in the invisible, in the unspoken, um, and yet tied to language and uh, to a talismanic quality of the language, which we will explore in a moment. This is a painting by uh, Rembrandt's most talented and gifted and amazing student, Gerrit Dow, and it hangs here locally in Los Angeles in the Getty Museum. I hope that uh, you'll come visit me and we can go see it together. I know uh, Jeff and I had seen it together. And uh, do is it's a tiny little image. You can see it's 12 by 8 inches, really minuscule details. And in this image, as we close in, we find um, a magician or astronomer or alchemist or a Kabbalist who is deep in his work. He is measuring the planets, the alignment of the astroglobe, planets on the astroglobe and checking. He's actually sitting, if we go back, he's sitting at the window opening. He's looking at the stars in the middle of the night. And uh, one of my favorite details is the bottle with the liquid. Uh, it's painted so exquisitely. It's smaller than what I could show you with my hand. And um, it has a color liquid that's projecting through the color shadow onto the table. And what he's doing, why it's there, he's charging this liquid in the moonlight. Uh, this is alchemy at its deepest moment. And so I just wanted to attract your attention that the subject of science and alchemy and magic is very much at heart um, on the mind of Rembrandt's circle. And even more so, um, I mentioned the word Kabbalah. Here we see the portrait of an old uh, Jew, a uh, Jewish man. Um, um, and what is Kabbalah? Kabbalah is a Jewish mystical tradition. Kabbalah literally means passing on the tradition and the tradition of mysteries that are coming uh, from generation to the generation. And uh, Rembrandt, interestingly, was a Protestant artist who painted, he was a Christian, who painted more Jewish subject than any other artist uh, through art history. Um, and he also lived in uh, the neighborhood that was called uh, Briestrat. And Briestrat, you can visit uh, uh, today, um, was a place where a lot of artists lived alongside with the recently immigrated Jews, specifically Portuguese and Spanish Jews. Uh, uh, Netherlands was extremely uh, receptive uh, to the Jewish population and allowed them to practice their religion and to publish uh, uh, manuscripts. And uh, Rembrandt is living around some of the greatest Jewish scholars of the time. Uh, next door is, for instance, Espinoza, um, a great scholar, a great philosopher. And another amazing visitor, another amazing neighbor is Minasa ben Israel. And here's a portrait of Minasa by Rembrandt. 
this rabbi was um, really progressive and he is responsible for founding the first Jewish press uh, printing Jewish literature in Amsterdam. And uh, so interesting that not only he was a neighbor of Rembrandt, uh, we're going to talk about also how he commissioned Rembrandt and inspired him. But I wanted to tie this idea between uh, Judaism and Christianity. And here's a scholar. This is a Christian scholar, a mystic, a great mystic, um, Abraham von Frankenberg. And he really championed that in order to be uh, uh, understand Christianity, one must, must study uh, Hebrew philosophy, ideas, and even the language. His quote was, outstanding, worthy, and deepest secrets are up to today preserved by the Jews. And he specifically said, if you want to understand these secrets, you have to study uh, the text of Minasa ben Israel, Minasa, who is the neighbor of Rembrandt. So here we have uh, on the right, a Christian scholar, on the left, a Jewish scholar, and Minasa commissioned prints from Rembrandt for his mystical, uh, great mystical publication. Here we see one of the four etchings for Daniel's visions. Daniel was considered a prophetic character. Uh, he comes from the book of Daniel. Uh, and uh, he had apocalyptic visions. And in his apocalyptic visions, uh, they are supposed to be of great meaning for the rest of the world, not just the Jewish population, but uh, uh, everyone for telling the future. Here we see one example of Rembrandt uh, showing you the, the beasts appearing. Uh, we could see a parallel in St. John's visions, apocalyptic vision. Uh, there is, seems to be a great crossover in this imagery. And um, um, Ben Israel is responsible for inspiring and whispering the ideas and the concepts and execution to Rembrandt on two of his most mysterious images. And that's what we're going to study today. The first one is a colossal painting. Uh, this is 66 by 82 inches in National Gallery, London. Uh, have you been to this museum, Jeff? Yes, it's a wonderful museum. It's a wonderful museum, and this is an amazing star in their collection. It's uh, Belhazar's Feast, um, and the subject of uh, this painting is actually a mystery, a revelation that's happening right in front of our eyes. Uh, a a, we could say a prophecy, an ancient prophecy that is appearing right in front of us. Um, what's happening, if we look a little bit closer, uh, Balthasar is having a great feast and uh, he's using the vessels that were stolen from the Jewish temple that were used for religious purposes for entertaining of his guests. And because of this desecration, uh, there is a warning that appears on his, on his, in front of him, in front of his wall. This warning is known as this became part of an expression in our common language. You probably heard this expression, the writing on the wall. So this writing on the wall appears and it seems quite disturbing and it stays there. And he calls in, the king calls in all of this, um, of all of his greatest uh, advisors, all of his philosophers, all of his mystics, and nobody's able to explain what it says. It seems like gibberish. And at that point, he then calls in Daniel, who we just mentioned a little bit earlier, Earlier. Uh, Daniel, the name Daniel uh, literally means um, uh, judged by God. So he calls in this uh, young man, this young Jewish man who happens to be at the Babylonian court because he was brought um, at some point uh, to it. He was uh, stolen and brought to, to Babylonia. And uh, uh, Daniel looks and interprets this message. But the first thing I wanted to ask our viewers and Jeff, of course, here is the feast. Here's the close up of the painting. We see the writing on the wall. We see the vessels. We see the guests. We see the king standing up um, in awe and, and fear. Where is Daniel? Can you find him? Oh, man. And uh, is this Daniel. is, of course, a question for our viewers. Can you find Daniel? Let us know what you think. Yeah, I mean, I, he can't be the one writing, right? That's that's. Uh, hand of can't God. be. That's, that's God's hands, right? Yeah, that's God's <laughs> hands. Um, 
looks like Rembrandt's wife. Uh, I don't know. There's a figure that's kind of in shadow back there, maybe. Um, right, I'm but then sure. he would be you. Uh, what yeah, I love about there must about be a Jeff, symbol for him somewhere in here. Maybe this lion head or. Jeff, what I love about you is that you never fall into my traps, and <laughs> you never answer if you don't know. I love that you say I don't know. This stumbles me, and that's sometimes a very profound answer in itself. Daniel is not here. <laughs> 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 it was a definitely a trick question, and that's what I want to do with our viewers: is train ourselves not to fall into reading the story linearly, but to think in this magical presence because it's very important. We are the Daniel. We are coming to see, uh, we are called into this table. We are the one who are looking at the ma magic writing on the wall. And we are asked by Rembrandt to interpret it like Daniel was asked to interpret it. So I want us to be on the lookout. We're in this magical position, right? We're in a powerful position. Uh, Jeff, A plus to you as always. <laughs> <laughs> so besides the writing on the wall, of course, the vessels themselves are uh, main characters here. And I just love what Rembrandt does um, in the composition. Notice how he, instead of turning the vessel sideways, he turned the vessel with its opening towards us. And if you look closely, can you see what's happening, uh, Jeff, with the vessel? Well, it looks like something's pouring out of it. Correct. So it's regurgitating. It's it's throwing up. It's rejecting uh -huh. the party liquid. This is Rembrandt interpreting. This is not in any text, right? He's saying this is unholy, like spewing out. And another thing that's so brilliant, uh, because we are uh, not just doing a history to we're doing art history and art appreciation. Uh, look at how he positioned the woman, the woman's body itself as a vessel with her neck pointed towards us the same uh, perspective as the neck of the vessel, right? If you were to uh, imagine her head coming off, it would open up with the throat. He's kind of emphasis on the throat and the thrusting forward. Really amazing dramatic composition. Here's another vessel uh, that's being turned over. It too is spewing out the liquid. It's really obvious in uh, this close up. But I've of course, a Mm -hmm. Jenny, I've got to do a shout out here to Robin. She she was correct in your question. She says Daniel is looking from our perspective. So kudos to her. Robin, thank you. I am not surprised. If it's the Robin I'm thinking it is, I'm not surprised. She's one of the most brilliant women I know. Uh, <laughs> here the, the chalice is being turned over and of course we're going towards the uh, writing on the wall. So it is written in Aramaic and Aramaic is very close to Hebrew. Those of you who read Hebrew would be able to recognize the letters and even uh, sound it out. But we cannot make any sense out of it. Hebrews uh, or Aramaic is equally read from right to left, right? So uh, for Latin readings, it, it would, we would say it backwards or Latin is backwards to Hebrew. It depends which uh, side you are looking from. Uh, but when you try to read this text, it means nothing. And that would be the intent of Rembrandt so that uh, like Balthasar, like the, all his scholars, you would say, I recognize the letters, but my God, don't I wish I knew what it meant. Until we realize that it is specifically coded in five columns and meant to be read vertically. So all the words are vertically and what they are, uh, many, many, so the first three letters is just the, uh, you could read M and Aleph, many, many, tekel, ufrasin. And ufrasin, uh, ufarsin is uh, spelled out in three letters, so two columns. And what this, uh, what, how Daniel, when he reads this out and spells this out, how he interprets this, it says, many is numbered. And this means that your days to the king this is a warning that your days at the court as a king are numbered. And he emphasizes it twice. Your days are numbered. You, you have been weighed. This comes from the Egyptian tradition, right? That carries over to many uh, religions that you, the scale of justice, right? You have been weighed. And if you are too light, that means that your deed have not been good. You've come up light on the scale. You have been judged and you've been too light in your deeds, not uh, correct. Correct, not not just. And Ufarsin, your kingdom will be divided. It will no longer belong uh, to you, and your enemy will take over. So um, 
you could see that this is a very menacing message. Now, this precise uh, uh, configuration of letters is found in Minas's publication. So Minas is the one who's teaching Rembrandt how to interpret this painting, how to show it. And uh, even a lot of the uh, 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 Jewish people would not be able to understand it at the time. This would be a really high mystical learned uh, uh, individual that would take understanding of this. And it took centuries to even, there's so much writing about it. There was so much misunderstanding. So you are receiving this message right now. Kabbalah means receive. You're receiving this from Rembrandt directly the way it was intended. Now, this is extremely interesting. Oh, uh, Jeff noticed God, God's hand. Uh, this is in a tradition of the Jewish tradition that you cannot show the face of God. Um, if we step back for just a second. Uh, we could see that God is represented, basically his voice is represented, the letters represent we are hearing God, and it's also, if we go step back, it's the source of illumination, right? All of the light is coming from that message, right? So this is extremely interesting. Uh, but God's hand, it's in the act of writing. And Rembrandt was cr criticized by the scholars that said that he confused noon with Zion and that it shows that he didn't really know Hebrew. So uh, uh, the last word, as you remember, is Ufrasin, ending with an N, and that would be the letter noon in Hebrew. But when we look at God's hand, the very last letter looks like Zion. Right, so it looks like a shorter N or Zion. And they said, you see, Rembrandt didn't really know what he was doing, but when the painting was x-rayed, noon in the longer letter was written and God's hand was removed, just kind of uh, aside to it. So Rembrandt painted it correctly and then later changed his mind and painted God in the act of writing the writing on the wall. So this is noon incomplete. He is about to complete the long letter. So what that means, going back to Robin's observation, that we are actually witnessing with Daniel and with everybody else in the, in the court, not the painting from 1650s, but right now, right this second, if this happened in front of us, right? Isn't that amazing, Jeff? That is. He is amazing. Yeah, and uh, from that, oh, sorry, that's the, that I meant to show you, Zion, that's the shorter letter. So uh, it was incorrectly thought that Rembrandt was writing Zion, but noon indeed he's writing. I'm fascinated okay. by the, the concept of the light coming from the letters too. It, it kind of takes me back to the light through the, the flask on the table of the astronomer, this idea of light as transformation or the, or the word Right, it, it, it's 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 a consistent theme uh, for yes. Rembrandt, isn't it? You nailed it. And so this idea that the writing itself is holy, that there is beyond the letters themselves are basically the presence of divinity right in front of us. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we're going 17 years later to the second most mystical, maybe one of the most mystical artworks in the history. Uh, one can say that um, it's a, in this case, it's an engraving. So unlike a painting, it's been reproduced so many times. And and it's housed, its versions are housed in every museum you can name. And this is uh, uh, attributed as a scholar in his study. So in this case, uh, we could see that the scholar, as we're looking closer, is indeed engaged in a mystical activity. Perhaps he is a Kabbalist or an alchemist. And we could tell that by the way he's dressed and by the apparition that is appearing that we're going to discuss in the window. The very same thing that Jeff was referring to, the disk of light, radiating light. So if we look closer at the main character, He's actually wearing uh, uh, something that reminds us of a Jewish prayer shawl that is called a talit that is thrown over his shoulders. And on his head, he's wearing what is called a sudra. This is a Middle Eastern origin of a hat that uh, we could find in different religions. And it was prevalent um, in Amsterdam at the time um, in the Sephardic Jews. And you could see it wrapped around the head and probably a kippah is hidden underneath a smaller hat, a garment covering his head. 
But most importantly, um, he is seeing this apparition in the window. And in this apparition in the window, there are angelic names. And this was the practice, the Kabbalistic practice, that you would pray and you would recite and you would focus yourself on the names of God, various names of angels and God. And eventually this really hot flashes of light would appear and illuminate you and great magic would happen. I wanted to attract your attention that uh, this apparition is appearing in the window and um, it has three circles and these three consecutive circles have different writing. So on the inner circle, we will, we will decipher each one in a moment, uh, we see Inri and this strange cross, almost like a plus sign. And then in the middle circle, we see if we read right to left, Adam Tidagiram, and don't worry, we'll explain everything what that means. And then the third one, larger circle, um, Amrtet Algar Augustina. And by the time we're done with this tour, these words will become your old friends and they'll mean a lot to you. But what's really interesting, did you notice, Jeff, that there is actually a hand in, uh, um, in the mirror, uh, in the window? I see that kind of opening, right? Right. And the pointing hand is, too, yeah. yeah, it's pointing. It's pointing at something extremely important. Can you make out what it's holding in the other hand and pointing to? I can't, no. I wonder if some of our uh, viewers were able to tell. It is actually a mirror. So someone, an angelic being or God himself or God through an angel is holding a mirror in his hand and pointing to it. And I took a little slide yesterday for fun. This is me with a mirror with my hand. And basically what this, <laughs> this clue is, this is a key that in order to understand this talisman, in order to decipher it, one must use the mirror. It is through the mirror writing that you'll understand the depth of this image. So this That's kind of, re isn't that great? So the reversal is going to show you the truth. We have this from all kinds of fol folklore, of course, uh, even in fairy tales, mirror, mirror on the wall, right? Asking the mirror for the truth. The mirror will always tell you the truth. It won't just reflect your beauty and flatter you. It will tell you who the fairest, it will tell you the depth. So an alchemical, mirror or Kabbalistic mirror is the one that reflect like it, it is thought that our world is just a reflection. But when you look at the reflection back into the mirror, you will see the truth that the God intended. So this idea of reversal and the truth, and we have it even in our language. If you uh, use the word spec to speculate, which is take ideas and think about them, right? To, to really imagine what they might mean comes from the word speculum or mirror. Right. So you're taking the reality, you reflect it or even the idea of reflection. Right. We reflect mm -hmm. the meaning. So this is extremely important to us. OK, so we go closer to the disk and we start with the um, uh, um, outer circle. And we're going to go closer and closer into the heart of this talisman and try to understand it. So um, you will see that at the bottom, the text begins. We could read it clockwise in Latin letters. <clears throat> and they're meant to be shuffled. There are three different distinct Kabbalistic practices, how to read text. One of them is by, it's called rotation of the alphabet. You rotate the letter. It's basically uh, like an anagram, right? And when you shuffle the letters, you derive a new meaning. So if we shuffle these letters, you will be able to understand in Latin, tangus larga latet amor. You will touch great depths. Love is hidden. And I find it very poetic that we started with a love image, the image of uh, the Jewish bride. And now at the heart of this cerebral uh, uh, image that has text and a scholar, what is at the root of it? The greatest step of this image is again, love. Now this points to uh, a Christian text uh, by St. Paul, uh, one of his letters to the Corinthians that he wrote out of jail. It's uh, letter number 13. And uh, specifically the second and the 12th uh, uh, stanza, if I have the gift of prophecy 
and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So this is a warning within the heart of the print. Even if you're a great scholar and you know everything what it means, but you don't, you come with it without love, it will mean nothing to you, right? You will kind of say, so what? So love is at the heart of this image. Love, the greatest love, love for uh, humanity, love for God, love for your art, love for each other, uh, a really deepest love. And then number 12, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. Isn't that fun? But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So here is a play on who is looking. What does it mean just God now uh, now knows me completely. It's like we are the painting to be read. God can see us, but we can't see God, right? And through this image, if we have love, we'll be able to have glimpse of divinity. We'll be able to get glimpse beyond the reflection, the puzzling reflection in the mirror. So this is what Rembrandt is trying to tell you with the outer circle. I pause here. Questions, comments? Well, I think people are just fascinated. I, as a matter of fact, that word is being used, fascinating, excellent, very interesting. So I think you've got people captured and captivated here. All I, right. I, uh, I love Everybody. That, mm -hmm. Oh, I love that Paul is brought into this because his his transformation was through light, right? He, uh, yes. Oh, my God. That is so genius. Uh, as usual, uh, Jeff, I get so inspired by you. And I wish <laughs> I brought in the slide of... Uh, um, my favorite painting of Rembrandt. Please look it up for everyone. Uh, this is homework. Travel to see uh, Rembrandt's self-portrait as St. Paul. He really identified with St. Paul and this idea of light. Uh, what happened to St. Paul, he was blinded by the light, but through this blindness, he was able to see. He was able to see deeper. So brilliant here. I should have used it. Minus to me. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we go into the second. You're ready to go to, we, we were in the outer circle. Um, let's just see what happens. Um, oh, no, we actually stay with the, with the outer circle. One more moment. Sorry, it is so deep that I'm trying to take you to such depth. So you see at the very type, uh, top of our phrase that we were deciphering, there is the word alga right? So if we use the mirror and read it backwards, right? It would be, read it for me, please, Jeff. A uh, backwards, alga backwards is? Agla. Agla. So agla is another Kabbalistic method, um, an acronym, or in, uh, in Kabbalistic term, we call it not not tarikon, and that is a practice that you take the first letter of the word and you spell out a sentence, a fuller meaning behind it. And for A is ata, uh, and for G is gibor, and for L is lealam, and for A is adonai. And this is a phrase which means, thou are mighty forever, O Lord. And it comes from the Jewish daily prayer, the most important prayer that is recited three times standing, uh, called Amida. And you have to, Amida literally means standing, because you are in such awe of these important words that you have to stand up while reciting. And when we look at the print, the actual scholar is standing. So it shows us how deeply Rembrandt understood the culture and is showing it to us that um, it is in this process of reciting these words again uh, that the miracle is taking place. I wanted to take you towards the full uh, sentence where uh, uh, it comes from Amida, and it comes from the second blessing, actually, uh, that is known as Guvarot, which literally means a power. And when we read the entire sentence, you will see we read from right to left. So you are mighty forever, O Lord, restorer of the dead you are. So 
very interesting. Where comes the power? It comes from, for God, you can actually reverse time. Time is just for people. He can bring back the divinity, the power, the higher power. Death is nothing. Uh, and this, of course, in the Christian mind, would bring up the images of Christ raising the Lazarus. And this is my favorite painting at Los Angeles County Museum here locally as well in Los Angeles, a tiny little image. Uh, 37 by 32 inches, not, not a huge painting, but showing Christ raising Lazarus out of the dead. This particular uh, talisman, we find it in uh, actually functioning Jewish coins and talismans and pieces of paper, um, <clears throat> agla, and it was used particularly for um, uh, helping against fires. So this is a very interesting moment. Why would this, the rising of the dead, would actually protect you against fires? Well, <clears throat> for the medieval mind and for the Baroque mind, uh, a drought was very important. And it was could be could actually mean the end of that city if you don't have the rain, right? And we had a lot of droughts in Los Angeles, a lot of fires, dangerous fires in Los Angeles. Uh, so we can really relate. Um, but... God seen as the one who can conquer death, and death is also shown as the cycles of nature. If the drought is death, the rain is life again. So this particular part of the anagram that we see is actually dedicated to this restore protection against natural disasters. Found that really, really interesting as well. Okay, so now we go to the middle circle. And that we find here, we are crawling towards the heart. And in the heart, we will find the deepest meaning. meaning. But in the second circle, it too can be read forwards or backwards. Again, forwards for Latin, backwards for Hebrew. You could say forwards for Hebrew, backwards for Latin. It depends what tradition you're coming from. Or the mirror image. This would be the reason, of course, that this uh, uh, is ciphered into the circular roundel because this way Rembrandt can arrange the text to be read any which way, right? Very convenient. So here we see the text Adam te dagiram and Ade, if you just change the letters a little, a little bit, Adam te adgiram will, will mean men, I will guide you. So this is a direct address to the viewer. Okay, guys? You ready? If you have love, if you've passed my test, if you use the mirror, I will guide you. This is a promise. If we apply the mirror and read this text the other way, you will have <clears throat> Adam to Dagiram read right to left, Mada te Marigad. And those are though these are Latin uh, letters, it becomes Hebrew meaning. And what it means, Mara is knowledge, and Te Mare God, master of binding. So what is knowledge and master of binding? This doesn't just ring a bell for all of us today, but it represents the science of the day. Here we go back to Gerard Du, and we see our alchemist. The alchemist, the basic function uh, that you do is you take the material and you liquefy it, and here we see the liquid. And the next step of liquefaction is coagulation. So you transform one matter into another. And that's what's about to happen. So when we go back to this uh, text, knowledge is the master of binding. It means that you are able to transgress one matter to another. Now, for royal talents and the blick, this means art supplies. Uh, it really means paint. Paint is the deepest alchemy, right? We take all these materials and they turn them to oil paint, things that I use in my painting, right? The Rembrandt paints. So here, uh, artists at the time and alchemists shared the laboratories, shared their ideas. We still do, right, Jeff? Absolutely. Uh, it's something that I talk about a lot when I'm, when I'm teaching 
as well. The artist as alchemist and the evolution of pigments and, and the close alignment uh, between the making of the materials and the meaning of the, of the work. It's really a fascinating. And it's so interesting, right? Because we are talking about magical practice. And those of you scientifically inclined might be saying, what is the superstition? But art is magical. We're taking this, you know, little bit of dirt, turn it into yellow ochre and make gold appear in a painting, yeah. right? All so, about transformation. <laughs> All about, All about yeah. and we witnessed this. And for Rembrandt, why would Rembrandt be attracted to Kabbalah and mysticism and all of this? Because he sees this potential throughout his paintings and etchings and drawings. He sees how images can be transformative, right? Mm -hmm. So now we go to the heart of the painting and we find the letters I N R I, Inri. And Inri is a classical tradition to refer to Christ, which literally you see here uh, spelled out to represent Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And this was a little note that was um, attached to the top of a cross to identify, mockingly identify Christ as the King of the Jews. Uh, and it became a tradition to, to encode and imply Christ through these four letters. Um, I show you here a Rembrandt painting, and those of you who want to see it a little bit closer for homework, uh, it's actually in the Church of St. Vincent in Amsterdam, not a museum, it would be wonderful to see it in person. I do know we always have uh, uh, viewers for these tours in Amsterdam, so please uh, go visit it for us. Um, you'll see even from far away image that it's written three times on a piece of paper above Christ on the cross because uh, 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 Rembrandt was so educated that he wrote it in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, not just the Latin abbreviation. So really a brilliant educated man. And um, <clears throat> in re for an alchemist, the alchemist wanted to show this transformation, that liquefaction and, and coagulation. How can you take this concept of Christ and look at it, how it, it uh, implies even a deeper meaning? How, what does Christ represent? And I really thought of Christ as the four elements of matter, right? So if you take these letters, um, I, uh, um, I in uh, Hebrew, uh, um, is yib, yibasha, which is, represents land or the element uh, uh, of matter. N is nur, light or fire. R is ruach or spirit, representing the air. And yim would be sea or water. So it's showing that we have a literal story of Christ, but Christ is also representing the four elements, the creation, uh, or everything like uh, and the, sp the spirituality was thought of. So I found this very, very interesting. But when we go back to Rembrandt's roundel, you'll see that um, there's something else that occurs to him. And at the top of the roundel is not I for Inri, I is to the right. At the very top is R. And Inri is rotated in such a way that it actually spells out R-I-I-N. Now I have to warn you that I in uh, contemporary Dutch in 17th century, uh, I and J in capital letters was spelled the same. So this is R-I-J-N, which is the last name of, drum roll, Jeffrey. <laughs> Rembrandt, this is Rembrandt's la last name, <laughs> Rembrandt von Rijn. So he saw Super. in this apula, amulet, which is already, he's, he's borrowing this, he's not inventing this amulet, but he's interpreting the entire image and how it should be read, right? He's orchestrating our reading of it. He sees himself as the artist, as the creator of those four elements, right? He's identifying, right? And this was really interesting. It's not aggrandizing, it's more to think about artist as the creator, artist as a magician, artist as an alchemist and say, I understand, I am within this circle as well, right? And for all of the artists watching, I think uh, this is such a wonderful uh, tradition. I, mm -hmm. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes, I, yes, yes. There's a question. I'm not sure whether you have the answer or not, but I thought it was a fascinating question. Um, and 
it's the idea of when did this idea of looking at a mirror begin or when, when do we start seeing it in, in art? So um, it's a very interesting question and has very deep traditions. Um, it's uh, one of the oldest uh, ma magical practices. So you'll see it all the way back as far as the documents allow us to uh, look back. It's described in the documents. But at the t this time in 17th century, there was a very popular alchemical text and it specifically um, emphasized the use of mirror and art. And there were three or four uh, different um, methods. One of them was um, a cylindrical mirror. So you would draw an image in perspective and it would make no sense. But when you would put a cylindrical mirror in the center of that image and look through the reflection, it would create the perfect perspective and you'd be able to read the image perfectly. An example of this practice you'll find in Holbein, and he will be ah, one of our stars yeah. uh, in 2022, uh, the anamorphosis, right? The skull that is um, in the ambassador painting, right? Uh, mm. uh, uh, stretched, and it makes no sense. It looks like a U of four hanging, but when you walk away from that painting, you turn diagonally, it forms an image of a skull. So um, this idea of using mirrors was very prevalent in... Uh, Renaissance, beginning Renaissance and in the height of the Baroque. And there were literally texts that would instruct you how to use mirrors to code your art and decode it as a viewer. That Holbein painting, doesn't it actually too have little viewers in the frame that encourage you to like look through them to, to see the hidden image? Yeah, we are, stay tuned. If you're patient enough, again, uh, it's going to be the, <laughs> the miracle of Holbein is gonna be one of our uh, subjects next year. Ah, oh, fascinating, wonderful. Uh, here, what I wanted to show you again, I mentioned this quickly, that Rembrandt is not inventing this magical talisman, but this talisman is borrowed from both Christian and Jewish uh, ideas, and it really existed. This is a text from 1672, uh, just within a couple of decades of uh, Rembrandt's print, and we see an actual stamp from the collection of a, mis a co collector who was interested in the stamps, um, uh, Breckenhofer. And what I wanted to point out, if you look at the top, um, on the right and on the left, these are mirror images, right? Because the stamp, the nature of the stamp, when you print it, what you see on the print is a mirror image. And that is very important to me for you to understand. Uh, and here we see that this is an exact, in fact, exact uh, uh, talisman that Rembrandt is using in his print. But that Rembrandt's artwork is functioning like a stamp. What do I mean by that? There is a reason why he didn't paint this image. There is a reason why he didn't draw it, right? Uh, he used the uh, engraving plate because by nature of engraving, you engrave an image, but when you pull the paper print of it, it's a reverse. And in this way, the plate and the printed image act like a mirror of each other. So magically, like a stamp, you're activating the talisman in both positions. So to me, I think there's a profound understanding why Rembrandt decided to use the material of engraving and printmaking rather than painting and drawing for this subject. I love that. I love that feature, that the idea of the process itself. Um you know, speaking to the content of the, of the painting. And in this way, I can even take it further and suggest to our viewers that perhaps Rembrandt is not looking at this as an artwork, but as an talismanic magical practice. Making the sprint is protecting himself, creating a talisman for him and his family, perhaps. So there is a real act of understanding um, of how these words and magical uh, incantation work here. This is another book of amulets, and it shows eight different uh, amulets uh, inspired by the Hebrew mysticism. And number eight is, again, uh, the exact talisman of uh, Rembrandt. Again, I wanted to show you how, how knowledgeable he was and how deeply he understood the functioning of this piece. And uh, again, here, the difference is that he took the exact talisman, but rotated the R to be at the top, right? I remind you of his biographical insertion here, 
R for Rembrandt, R for Rhine, right? And indeed, I wanted to go to his signature. And since we're talking about Rembrandt today and how words function in his art, he almost signed almost every work of art he made. Signature was very important to him. And I mentioned this early on in our first tour, I think already now a year ago. So I'll come back to this briefly. Uh, so this will be for a reminder for who watched me before, but very interesting for our new viewers and a great reminder that Rembrandt's name itself carries deep meaning. First of all, when he was born, he was named Rembrandt without the D. So when we look at this name, the D in his name is self-imposed. When you look at legal documents, he always set, signs his name without that D, simply R-E-M-B-R-A-N-T. If you try to pronounce the two, the D is silent. You won't hear the difference, but it makes a huge philosophical difference. He also writes his name as he adds the D separated. It's no longer one word. It's two words. Can you see the space between? Rem Brunt. And this I have to uh, uh, share. This is my uh, discovery. A few years ago, I wrote an article about this. It occurred to me that I better look up the meaning of these two words. And in uh, Old Dutch, when we looked at two words, rem means dim, dim or dark, and brand with a D means bright, fire, light. And how do we know Rembrandt best? Is by his amazing mastery of chiaroscuro, the separation of light and dark, the technique that it is also extremely mystical. If we look at it through the alchemist way, right, separating the light of the moon and the sun. Uh, if you go to the Genesis, to the beginning of the Bible, the first, in the beginning, God separated the night and day. Uh, it is uh, the deepest mystery, which is contained now within the signature of Rembrandt. Every time he writes his name, he reminds us of the mystery of duality between light and dark. That's wonderful, Eugenia. And, and after hearing what we did today about his interests and how he put these messages and his attention to the detail, it makes this seem even more clear and intentional, right? Yes, and do we have any comments or questions before we have the grand finale? Um, let's see, go back there. So many things happening here, lots of comments happening. Um, lots of amazement. People, of course, are really enjoying. Um, somebody else said the same thing, Laura. I love the idea. Etching is an amazing practice. So that, that process of it is really resonating with people and uh, folks loving the images that you're sharing as well. Great. If you have any questions, we are going to be here a few more minutes. So please send them to us or comments. We'd we'll love to hear from you and address uh, your thoughts. So I wanted to come to the conclusion with looking back at Rembrandt. And there is a great quote that's attributed to him by his early biographers. And I've never shared this before, so I want to share it with you today. A painting is complete when it has the shadows of a god. I read it again, a painting is complete when it has the shadows of a God. So this is very interesting because we have light and enlightenment and radiation as kind of a visions of God. But what Rembrandt is trying to apply to us, that shadow is equally important. Without shadow, we have no light. And if light, if God casts the light, then from light we have the greatest shadow. And if you touch by the shadow of God, you touch by light. And here we go back to his name, Rembrandt, dim light or dimmed light. And we look at the chiaroscuro in his eyes, one eye is in light, one eye is in the darkness, in his division in his face, and he is touched by God. And I hope that all of you felt the touch of Rembrandt through this Talking Paintings tour. Wonderful, wonderful. There's some questions coming in now, Jenny, and I love that finish to it. Uh, it. It is so true, right? There is not one without the other. And we use that as painters uh, uh, often, and we can go back to 
to Rembrandt for that. And somebody brought up a great question here too. They were wondering if Caravaggio was influenced by Rembrandt, but it was probably the other way around, wasn't it? Uh, at least Correct. in terms of the use of chiaroscuro, but it, Rembrandt definitely took it to another level with the, the hidden symbolism or disguised meanings. Caravaggio's meanings were much more uh, on the, on the surface of the painting, so to speak. Uh, so um, this is a tour that I once would like to do, and I'm reminded by this question. Uh, I'm actually comparing the black and the dark Caravaggio versus Rembrandt. And I'll, I'll take an opportunity to give you a quick preview with this answer. Of course, it is Caravaggio who influenced Rembrandt. Rembrandt never traveled to Italy. If you were an educated painter at the time, the dream was to travel to Italy on a grand tour and be inspired by Caravaggio and other masters. He didn't have that opportunity, but his teacher did. Uh, Peter Lassman traveled to uh, to Italy, was so inspired by Caravaggio that he started almost a whole Caravaggisti school in Amsterdam. And so they always say that Rembrandt did not travel to Italy, Italy traveled, or Rome traveled to Rembrandt. And so he was from early on extremely inspired by the chiaroscuro, chiaro being light, scuro being dark, um, from the early on of his, from his teacher. But the difference, the main difference for me between Caravaggio, who I adore, and we're going to have a special tour next year as well on Caravaggio and his mysteries, and Rembrandt, Caravaggio's black is the true black. And it is flat and it is like a black hole. It swallows you, it's infinite, there's nothing in it. It's extremely theatrical, it's like being on stage and it's backlit so that everything in, in the front pushes forward, everything in the back disappears. Rembrandt's dark or black is full of mystery. When we look in his dark passages, we start seeing faces and hints and words and images and overpainted areas that are coming back through and insisting. So the, it is not their lights that are different, it is their darks that are philosophically opposite. Fascinating, wonderful. I look forward to that. Carvaggio is you know, definitely one of my favorite painters as well. Lots of kudos, lots of, uh, in, we have, Margaret says it's very enlightening talk. <laughs> and and what I was uh, hoping that when you go back to your books on your shelf, when you go back to internet browsing uh, today through Google Images, you can bring up these images so magnified and study them. And of course, my favorite, when you go back inside the actual museums, that you will notice more messages, messages that scholars haven't talked about yet. And your revelation, your enlightenment is just, if not more important. And when you see it, write to us right away so we can become rich and wealthy with Jeff, right? <laughs> so do share it with us. <laughs> it is. It is wonderful. And that's great advice. And, and I hope as we all are returning there that we do spend a little more time uh, as we uh, engage with these wonderful works of art to, to seek out these types of meanings, whether they're your own interpretations, like you said, or or trying to understand what you think the interpretation of the artist, but it just is so much richer. And that's something I've really enjoyed, Genia, from these shows and sharing this time with you is slowing down and, and helping me uh, to slow down and look deeper into the work and, and garner more meaning. So thank you, uh, as always, for this inspirational and inspiring time. Pleasure, pleasure. Well, um, there's a lot more. I tried to stay in an hour today because I know our one hour tours uh, spread to almost two hours in the past, but I, <laughs> the, the information was so dense that I didn't want to make it too complicated. I wanted to actually make it friendly and feel like it had developed inside you and made sense to you. So um, I tried to make it a little uh, sweet and short today, uh, but I'm happy if there's any other comments, otherwise we're really coming to the end. Absolutely, absolutely. And well, it'll be a catalyst, I'm sure. I like that, you know, to, to tease us a little bit with uh, what I'm sure is a very rich and, and deep study. Uh, and definitely continue to make comments. Jenya is fantastic about going back and reading through them and responding. So uh, 
even if you didn't catch the beginning and go back and then something comes to mind, continue to comment and we'll continue to engage. And, and uh, thank you again, Jenya, and thank you everybody for joining us. Did you have one more thing you wanted to announce? I was just gonna say, I will post that publication about mirrors uh, that's contemporary to Rembrandt. So look out for that. I will post uh, the reference. The interesting part, some of these original books you could still buy on eBay. You can buy them in reprint for $15 or you can buy them for a few thousand dollars, the original text. Uh, uh, text and books are still not as expensive and artworks today. So it's amazing to have something like that in your collection. Perfect, perfect. And I guess one more announcement too would be in the interim, since we're only doing them live every other month, we were just talking today how we're going to be posting links to previous episodes. Now, you can always go and look them up on our Facebook page at Royal Talents NA, but we're going to go ahead and post some links to some YouTube channels uh, that Jenya has created so you can go back uh, and maybe stimulated to go back and, and look at uh, some of the previous episodes because there really is a link. Uh, between them. Uh, things that we talked about today, uh, like Jenny pointed out, are related to previous talks. So we'll encourage you to do that and we'll be posting those as well. And uh, a special thank you to Jeff for always surprising us with his hats. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. Got to have fun. You got to have fun, right? Get into we character. <laughs> can't wait to see you next time. We're going to see you in January with, uh, as, as I said, I always like to make a difference. So the next tour will be de dedicated to a woman artist, one of the greatest drafts, draftswoman ever in history of art, Katie Kolovitz, and her political uh, sentiment of what an artist should do to make a change in the world. So it will be far from mysterious, but very moving and very uh, still politically resonant. Very powerful images. Uh, you cannot look at her work and not come around, come back emotionally uh, affected by, by them. They're really, really wonderful and powerful images. That'll be exciting. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we will see everybody next time on the Invisible Museum Tour and uh, keep an eye out for those links to previous episodes. We'll talk to everybody soon. Take care and have a happy Halloween. <laughs>